Give him a hand clap. Praise God. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, worship team. Amen. Did a great job. It's not easy doing it with CDs. We don't have the uh, lead guitarist or rhythm guitarist, so they're kind of having to wing it, and I thought they did a good job. Praise the Lord. I felt the presence of the Lord. Amen. You know, uh, sometimes we can turn this into entertainment uh, and uh, forget that this is really just about worshiping the Lord, not about you getting entertained. Praise the Lord. So, uh, amen. I hope that uh, you were putting something into this for the Lord and not just trying to get something out of it for yourself. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. God is good. Thanks again, Suzanne. Love you and appreciate all that you're doing. Praise God. And Mike up there, amen. Flipping switches and (laughs) dialing dials. Yes. Glory to God. Doing stuff that I have no clue what he's doing. So no matter what he does, it's right. Praise the Lord. And Sheila, what more can I say about Sheila? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. She's a trip. Good girl. Praise God. Amen. God bless everybody. Appreciate you being here this morning. Amen. And it's always good, as yes. Tim says, and it's so true to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. God is good. You know, I hate peer pressure. I'll bet you do too. I'll give you a minute to just think about that. Praise the Lord. Okay, I had some bad news this week. I'm going to share it with you, and then we can get on to the good stuff, all right? Some fool, I don't know why anybody would do this, but my toilet was stolen. Yeah, and I have no clue who took it. I mean, I've got nothing to go on. (laughs) All right, praise God. God's always in a good mood. He's got a great sense of humor. Praise the Lord. (laughs) Diane can only shake her head and think, help him, Lord, help him. Praise God. (laughs) Praise the Lord. I've got more, but I'm saving up for a a stand-up routine in case. Y'all turn on me one of these Sundays. Praise the Lord. But I want to talk to you about some things this morning. For those of you that were here last week, Uh, why last week's message was so important Uh, because it's God's plan for us and without us understanding that we're totally redeemed that we are completely forgiven Uh, you can't start you know dissecting your lifestyle and you know kind of figuring I've made this mistake or I've made that mistake or I'm not this or I'm the other thing because the minute you do that you move yourself out of the position that God needs you to be in Amen. So that you can do what he has called us to do. What he has born us again to be a part of. So you have to feel like, uh, not necessarily that you're worthy, but that God has deemed you worthy. Because if you start dealing with the worthy stuff, all of us will find a reason to not be worthy. But he has declared us worthy. He's declared us to be holy, to be righteous, to be all that God demands, amen, for a person to be one with him. Amen. That's done. That's a finished thing. And that that was the whole point of everything we talked about last week. It is finished. And only from that position can you then begin to receive and operate within the inheritance that God has for you and rise up to the level of who we are in Christ. And that's incredibly important. For 2,000 years, we've been making this about religion and not about Jesus. Amen. Now, we talk about Jesus and we talk about God and we talk about being good and being better and and doing better and all that stuff. And we want to be good people. We want to be, you know, we want to behave as as godly people. But we know that we don't always do that. And even if you always do it, you're not always thinking it. And Jesus made it clear that your thoughts condemn you as much as your actions because God sees the heart. And so he knows when you're thinking, I just soon slap them as smile at them. Amen. You lust after somebody, that's, you know, I'm not saying go ahead and do it. I'm just saying, but you're already guilty, you know. So that's what God has redeemed us from. He's written his laws in our heart instead of giving us a list of do's and don'ts because he found out over a thousand years or or 1,500 years with all those lists, they still came short. They still fouled up. And the reason for that was to bring us to the end of ourselves. 
so that we would then turn to a savior, amen, which is where Israel fell short. He came into his own and his own received him not. They didn't recognize him. They just wanted another rule. You know, they just wanted another regulation that they thought they might be able to keep. So, with that in mind, let's begin. Uh, we'll start here with Luke chapter 5, Sheila. Now I want to read verses 17 through 25. This really isn't, well it is, but it isn't really the message. But I want to, I want to set this up so we, get, we have the context of what it is we're dealing with here. When the Holy Spirit speaks to us through the scripture, he's, trying to, he's talking to somebody who's spiritual. Okay, he's not talking to the flesh because he's already told us the the flesh of you will not receive the things of God. Right. You want to dumb it down to something intellectual or something physical, like a rule or a regulation or something, but that won't work. We have the Holy Spirit now. The, the reason we get born again is so we have the Holy Spirit, so we can by it be led by the Spirit of God. Right. We I got a body, okay, and I but it, this is just a house, and one of these days I'll leave the house, yep. and the body will be dead. Okay, I've lived in a lot of houses over the years. Sally and I together, we lived in uh, several places in Texas. We've lived all over the state of Iowa, well, not all over the state of Iowa, but all around uh, central Iowa here for sure. And then besides that, I've lived in, I've lived literally from one end of this country to the other. I mean, I lived in Florida, I lived in the Carolinas, I lived in Maryland, I lived in Pennsylvania, I lived in California, I lived in Colorado, I lived in Texas, I lived in Minnesota, I lived in Michigan. I could go on and on. I, I don't even remember all the places I've lived. I mean, there was a warrant out for quite a while. Praise the Lord. I keep moving. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I just kept moving. I was just, I was never satisfied with wherever I was. I always had to be someplace else. So anyway, I'm just saying, but I didn't change. Right. <laughs> I mean, the, the residence I was in, I'd leave, but I was still me. Right. Well, that's what happens you know, when a person dies, we don't die. We just change residence. We just move right. to another location. Amen. Right. We just leave this house and find another house. Yep. Amen. A house that will never grow old. The, right. you know, uh, your lifetime house. Right. You know, your yes. eternal house. The house that you'll dwell in forever. Amen. So, one of the th when Jesus came, he came to, to make a uh, transition from the old law, from the covenant, to the new covenant of grace, or from the dispensation of law, if you want to use dispensationalism, to the dispensation of grace. Mm -hmm. Dispensation of grace is where we are today. Yes. It's where we will be, amen, till the millennial reign. Yes. So that's what the Jews did not understand. And the reason they didn't understand it, because they had this intellectual way of looking at it, rather than a spiritual way, because they had no spirit. Right? right? So when they thought the Messiah was coming, that's why they were constantly saying, will you set up your kingdom now? In other words, are you going to overthrow the Romans now? And, and it's just going to be Jews that are ruling. They didn't understand that he said, my kingdom's not of this world. If it were, I could call angels right now and wipe this whole mess out. But that's not my purpose. My purpose here is to bring you a spiritual kingdom. And I have to get you prepared for that. Because it can't happen until I'm dead. Until I die and give you a new testament or a, a new will. Okay, so the testator has to die before the New Testament can go into effect. Right. Well, she was trying to set them up for this, but they refused to see that there was a transition taking place. They thought for sure it's just going to be this stuff forever. Mm -hmm. Right? It's just going to be mm -hmm. sacrifice, sacrifice, rule, rule, rule. Keep this, do that, and the other thing. So this is what we're confronted with here in Luke chapter 5. Beginning at verse 17, it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. So here he is, he's in this house, and it's all of a sudden it's filled with all of these preachers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All of these uh, PhD doctors of divinity. Uh -huh. Only they're Jewish, right? They know the law. They know the rules. They know the, the regulations. They know everything that is demanded by Jewish law. And yet, the Spirit of God was there because Christ was there to heal all of them. Yes. Right? And behold, men brought in a bed, a man which was taken with a palsy. Now, none of them got healed. Right. Because, how, you know, you got to believe. Exactly. Right? So none of them got healed. They were too busy trying to... 
find something wrong, you know, find somewhere where they could, you know, where the law wasn't being obeyed or, or applied, right? But there was a guy with a palsy, and they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him, but all these religious people are there in the way, and they couldn't get to him. So when they could not find by what way they might bring him in, because of the multitude, they went up on the housetop, and they let him down through the, til uh, through the tiling with his couch or with his bed into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. Now you look at that, and the first thing you think is, Wait a minute, Jesus has missed the point here. This guy's obviously sick. He's in a bed and they tore the roof off to get him there so that he could get healed. But Jesus doesn't even address the healing aspect of it. He says, your sins are forgiven. Yeah. Praise the Lord. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this which speaks blasphemies? Who can, for who can forgive sins but God alone? Right. Perfect revelation of the fact they didn't recognize their Messiah. Right? right? So they're still trying to get this into a religious mode where they have some, uh, where they know a little something, right? And when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answering said unto them, what, Why reason ye in your hearts whether it is easier to say to the sins, Be forgiven thee, or to say, Rise up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power upon the earth to forgive sins. And he said unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy couch and go unto thine house. And immediately he rose up before them, took up that whereon he lay and departed to his own house, glorifying God. Praise the Lord. So that's kind of the, this is the whole scenario, right, uh, of what's happening from the time of Jesus' uh, declaration of who he was until his crucifixion. Mm -hmm. Then Paul comes along with this face-to-face uh, -face, uh, encounter with Christ and begins and, and is caught up into the third heaven. And this is a guy with you know, the Pharisee of Pharisees knows all the, the, the Scripture, all the Talmud, all the, the whole Old Covenant and all this stuff. And he knows it in and out. That's his forte. And Jesus looks him face to face and says, this is that which you have been studying all your life. This is the fulfillment of everything you've been spending all your time with. And Paul gets this tremendous revelation and goes on to preach the grace of God and everything we talked about last week. So with that in mind, here we are. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now this is Paul talking to these people that are coming out of Judaism mm -hmm. into Christianity, or what we today call Christianity. And they're still hung up with all this stuff, and we know they are because they were still even bickering amongst the, the preachers in the New Covenant Church over whether Gentiles had to be circumcised once they came to Christ or whether all these things that were still issued, the religious uh, rules and regulations that we're still struggling with. But Paul says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Now, if you just leave that up there for a second, Sheila. Hear that word, uh, world. Be not conformed to this world. We think world, we think cosmos, we think you know, planet Earth, whatever. But that is not what that word means. That's a Greek word, and the word is aion, which is a specific uh, Jewish messianic period, is what they're referring to. A, this world, or this age, is another way it's translated, that, he's, that Paul's speaking of here. He says, be not conformed to this age, or to this specific uh, messianic period, or the time when Jesus was here, which was pre Grace. It was still under the law. It was a transition. It was a time that Jesus was trying to people, bring people and prepare people for what was to come. Yeah. And that's where their heads are still in this mumbo jumbo here. And so that's what Paul's addressing. He's saying, don't be conformed to this Hebraic way of doing things or understanding Scripture, right? A specific, this period, okay? And that word actually comes from a root word, which is chronos, which we know is the Greek word chronos, which means season. So don't be conformed to this season that you, you're hung up in. Right. But be ye transformed yes. right, by the renewing of your mind so that you can prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Yes. Amen? Amen? So, the victory that overcomes the world, Paul also tells us, is faith. The victory that overcomes this is faith, not more education, 
It's good to know the Bible and to read it and memorize it or whatever. But the thing that he's dealing with here is this season or this time of transition that people are not able to get out of. And to tell you the truth, in 2018, we're still there. Yes. We're, we're still struggling with the same stuff. I'm talking about the church in general or religion in general for that matter. Now, I'm not picking on people. I'm just saying this is just the reality. And if you, I'm not just telling you what the Bible says, so you have every right to disagree with me. But you just, you're going to be wrong anyway. So. So, be not conformed to this world, okay? But be you transformed. How do you, how, do, how do you get transformed? By the renewing of your mind. You've got to change the way you think about this stuff, or you're never going to get anywhere from where you are. You're just going to keep going down that same path around the same mountain, dealing with the same religious rituals and rules and regulations and biases and, and, and bigotry and all this stuff over this. Well, that's sin. That's a lot worse than that sin. You know, so I don't do that one. You do all. It doesn't matter. Everybody is messed up. Yeah. Okay. I mean, everybody has issues. That's the fact. I'm looking at everybody here. Love you. Know you're all good people. Mean well. Yeah. But you all got issues. Yeah. We all got them. I got them. You got them. Yeah. All God's children got issues. That's why we got Jesus. Yes. Amen. And that's what he's trying to get them to understand. You've got to come to a place where you receive this grace, this gift from God, or you'll never be able to rise up to what it is I have for you. Now, the, one of the things that happens is when we first begin to realize this, people go a little bit crazy. It's kind of like the first year in college. You know, you've been at home, you've been controlled, you've been, or your first, you know, a house away from home or whatever. You go flip over. I mean, you just do everything because you think, oh, I can do it now because I don't have anybody watching. Right. right? Well, it isn't too long, a few years. In my case, it was about 30. But still, you'll come to the place where you realize some of this stuff, it's legal. It's just not expedient. I mean, it's, it's a lawful. I can do it. But it really, you know, doesn't work real well with my relationships kind of creates problems on the job, right. you know, has issues with my health. Right. You know, he's, what I'm saying, God still loves me, yeah. right. you know, but I'm just, I'm having dysfunction, you know, with all my relationships and everything else because I haven't realized that this is a freedom right. to be set free right. from anything that would hold me in bondage. Right. Now, that doesn't mean I can't do some stuff, but if you do it to the point where it becomes destructive, yeah. Yeah. now you're hurting yourself. Yeah. And as I said last week, right. sin now is not vertical. Right. God has already dealt with the sin issue as far as born-again people are believed. Right. Our sin issues now are horizontal. Right. So when I do, I don't love my brother, I create problems. Yes. Not between me and God, but between me and my brother. Right. You see what I'm saying? That's why Paul says, you know, Jesus talked about love one another, love your brother as you love the Lord. Keep the love commandment and you won't be a sinner or you won't, uh, you won't come short. You will kept all of the commandments as far as God's concerned. And we know this. I mean, innately we know this because it's our dysfunction amongst ourselves that creates the problem. Amen. Either God has settled it or he hasn't as far as he and I are concerned. Right. But he hasn't necessarily settled it as far as you and me are concerned. Yeah. If I do stupid stuff to you, it's going to aggravate you, and you'll probably do something stupid to me. And you see what I'm saying? We just perpetuate what we call sin. But no matter what that is, this is what's supposed to set us free to love one another, is that God has loved us to the point where he's not holding any of this against us anymore. So we have, we have the ability, the potential to have heaven on earth, but we create hell on earth amongst ourselves. Not between us and God. Right? So, okay, that's, that's the point. Yep. So, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. How do you get faith? By hearing the Word of God. Yes. Faith comes by hearing. So, by renewing your mind, amen, you overcome. And that's what, just exactly what he's telling us right here, okay? So, I just spent 10 minutes kind of meandering around trying to make a point. But that's the issue, all right? Be not conformed to this world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So now I'm going to read you a translation, the worst translation. <laughs> I don't mean the worst. It's W-U-E-S-T. It's a guy. It's a translation he wrote. You may find it to be the worst, but I didn't. I thought it was pretty good. So here's his translation of this same scripture, and I think it's right on. Stop assuming an outward expression that does not come from within you and is not representative of what you are in your inner being, but is patterned after this world. 
but change your outward expression to one that comes from within and is representative of your inner being by the renewing of your mind, resulting in your putting to the test what is the will of God, the good and well-pleasing and complete will, and having found that it meets the specifications, place your approval on it. Okay? Does it, do you all hear that? Do you want me to say it again? Just, I will. Stop assuming, this is that, the translation of this, okay? Stop assuming an outward expression that doesn't come from within you and is not representative of what you are in your inner being. Mm, right. But it's patterned after this, this world or this yeah. attitude of everything's not quite done. I still got a bunch of stuff to do here to get God's okay right. so that we're going to be all right. You know what I'm saying? So change your outward expression to one that comes from within and is representative of your inner being. And you do that by renewing of your mind and the result resulting in your putting to the test what is the will of God. In other words, trying it, testing it by faith, going by faith, right? Yeah. And the good and well-pleasing and complete will, having, uh, f having found that it meets the specifications of what God demands, the good, perfect will of God, mm -hmm. and that it meets those specifications, then place your approval on it. Okay? Yeah. That's what Paul's telling us. Yeah. Yes. Quit Quit. Quit acting like this is who I am. Right. And start understanding that who I am is in here and you can't see it. Right. God has already declared this reality to be the reality. Yes. And that's how I have to think. That's how I have to operate. And in order to do that, I've got to go back to the Word of God and do the same thing Jesus did. See, the only real difference between Jesus and us right now is that Jesus found himself in here. Yes. And he swore to be that person that he found. That's me. This is me. I found it. Well, that's what we're supposed to do. We're not supposed to be reading this to find all of our faults. Right. We're supposed to be reading this to find out who we are in Christ. Yes. What authority we have. Yes. What freedom, what liberty we have in God. What, what forgiveness we have. What redemption we have. You know, all those things. Praise the Lord. All right, 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 5 excuse me, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. And I'll try to be more focused, but it's hard. I said before, I'm not random. I just talk faster than you can think. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Yeah. See, we have to believe these scriptures. Sure you, can't just, you can't just read them and go, oh, yeah, well, okay, I heard that. But no. Right. You have to embrace it. You have to believe it. Say, okay, that's me. This is, who I, this is who I am. I am a new creature. I'm not becoming a new creature. I'm not going through some chrysalis or some, some uh, you know, metamorphosis. I'm, I am the new creature. Okay, so therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. And old things are passed away. Everything is new. All right? Because of your new birth, because of being born again, we were placed in Christ where we became partakers of His divine nature. Right? That's what the Scripture says. And we have become partakers of His divine nature. We are children of God. We have the nature of God. That's what God sees. That's how He sees us. Amen? All right, Galatians 1, verse 13 and 14. And see, here the struggle is we see all the other stuff. And we're so, uh, you know programmed to believe that's the reality, exactly. right? That we, can, we don't do what Paul says, I just see Christ and Him crucified. Uh -huh. No, we see your stupid act. We see your ignorant response. We, we, yeah. we see our own stupidity. We see our own coming short, and that becomes the focus, yeah. and we never get any further than dealing with our own issues sure. that have already been dealt with. Sure. Right. If we are set free, then we can set others free. If we really believe in grace, it's not to be selfish with it. It's if I have grace, if I really understand this grace, I'm, I'm giving it away. It's free. It's, I, it's the blessing that makes me a blessing. I'm not judging. I'm not critiquing anymore. That's not my job. If God's good, I'm good. Yes. You know, if you're really ignorant, I'll just stay away from you. <laughs> right? I mean, you know what I'm saying? If, you, if you're just vicious or mean or whatever yes. and, and just got those kind of issues, well, I'll just, you know. Yes. I'll just back off a little bit. But 
I'm not going to declare you lost or I'm not going to declare you damned. That's God's already done this and it was His job to do it. And He did a good job, praise the Lord. Because if I start doing that, then what happens? The, the, what always happens is this. What we project is what we feel. So if I'm judging, it's because I'm feeling judged. I'm judging my own conscience is bothering me because I know I'm coming up short. And so it's reflected in the way that I deal with other relationships. So the, the only way you get free is by freeing other people. Right. All right? So for, it, for ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion. This is Paul again. How that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. This was a, I mean, he was a vicious guy, a religious radical. Amen? And profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my father. So Paul was a radical Rule keeper, a, a radical law uh, a person, you know, just this, this bad guy, praise the Lord. So Paul's telling us we aren't to pursue religious traditions, amen, or a gospel that is after man or after our father's traditions or anybody else's tradition for that. He said he profited in the Jews' religion far above his equals. So he was the, the Pharisee of Pharisees, he called himself, amen. He was zealous of their traditions. He was a religious hammer, you know. But it wasn't enough. It didn't reveal Christ. That's what his revelation became. He understood. No matter how zealous I am, no matter how religious I am, it never satisfies because Christ isn't produced. There's no revelation of Jesus. That's Luke 5. That's what was going on back there. These guys are zealous. and they're de They don't want a revelation of this Messiah. They want the rules. Yeah. Praise the Lord. And that kept them from having a revelation of Jesus. Yeah. It kept them from seeing a manifestation of God in the flesh. Yeah. Yeah. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, verses 7 through 11. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So the Holy Spirit is telling us that God's power, or what God did was pour Himself into earthen vessels, into human beings, so that the excellency of the power would be God and not us. Yeah. Praise the Lord. So then, so what I'm saying is, He came to live inside of me so that I know if I have any consciousness of the Spirit at all, I'd recognize anything good coming out of this, it's God. Yes. It's not me. Right. I can't get the credit for this. I can't take the glory for it. Because I know what I am. I'm a screw up. I'll foul it up. I'll mess it up. I'll, I'll intentionally do stuff that's not right. And yet God can still move and live and have his being. Amen. In me. If I can acknowledge that. So it's God. Whatever good's coming is going to be God. Amen. So I can start trusting in God instead of in me. All right. So the excellency of God. So then Paul goes on through these experiences that he's had being troubled, perplexed, persecuted, despair, forsaken, in all these things, in every situation, we can see that we are more than conquerors, that we can walk through them. This is what we're talking about here this morning. I had conversations with uh, Peter's going through a lot of stuff with his job. And, and, and we all got something. We, we all got some kind of pressure. We all got some kind of issue, right, that's going on. It's either ours or somebody that's close to us. But it's just the reality of life. What Paul is telling us, in all these things, you can still get past it. You can get through it because of Christ. But you have to keep the focus on Him. Because yes. the minute we put the focus back on us, yes. comes failure, comes despair, comes d discouragement, comes yes. frustration. Amen? Yes. So we have to keep the focus on Him. We have to understand that this God in me is going to get me through this. Yes. Amen? And raise me, amen, to a place where He can really use me. Yes. Amen? And, be, and I can be blessed and be a blessing at the yes. same time. All right? Yes. Romans 8, 29 and 30. Because everybody's got a mess. If you don't have one today, you had one yesterday. If you don't have it today, you'll have it next week. I mean, you're going to have it. How's this for, you know, prophecy? 
edifying, isn't it? No, this is just reality. I'm just saying in this life you will have tribulation. There's going to be crap fall on you and you need to know how you deal with it. Exactly. And if you try to deal with it in your flesh, it's just going to get uglier. Yeah. It'll just be exacerbated. The only way to deal with it is in Christ. Amen. Recognize who you are. Recognize what God has done. Amen. And, and operate from that position. So for whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son. That's us He's talking about. Who He knew. Now, He knew us before the foundation of the world. In Christ, He knew us, right? So, He did foreknow. Those He also predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. He's a brother now. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. You understand? That's what we're talking about. The difference between my big brother Jesus and me is He knew who His daddy was from day one. Right. And I didn't believe it. But I don't look like him. I don't act like him. I think somebody else was messing around with mama. Yeah. Praise the Lord. We're all adults here. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I just don't feel like his kid. Right. Now I know he is. Because he looks just like him. He acts just like him. He, right. he has the same way of speaking. and But yeah. not so much me. But that's the point. I gotta find myself to be that brother, to understand God sees me exactly the same way. Right. Before I can live that kind of a life like I'm supposed to live. So that he might be the firstborn among men. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, then he also called. And whom he called, then he also justified, and whom he justified, then he also glorified. Praise the Lord. Yes. That's powerful. God has one purpose, yes. one intent, and that is that. He would be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Yes. Praise the Lord. Exactly. Moses, remember Moses says, show me your glory. Yeah. He was God's friend, the Bible says. Uh -huh. Spoke. Amen. All the time. Show me your glory. It was given to us. Yes. Yes, it was. Why? Because Moses didn't have the spirit. He could not deal with the glory. Yeah. But because we've been born again... The glory is ours. Yes. It's who we are. It's what yes. we are. Now I know that's a stretch because we still think of ourselves as human. Yep. We're just living in a human house. We're just living in a human being. But that's not who we are. Right. Praise God. Yes. Colossians 1, 26-28. The, even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to His saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Amen. That means mature. Yes. Praise God. Genesis 1.26. We'll try to hit every book in the Bible. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creepeth on the earth. Amen. God said, let's make man to look like us. Yeah. Or we could just say it. The father said, let's make some kids that will look just like me. Yeah. Amen. And because they're my kids, they've got dominion over that earth. I'll rule here, and I'll give them this place that they can rule. Yes. I'll extend heaven to earth. I'll expand my kingdom and give them rule over that part of it. Yes. Right? That's, I mean, that's literally what God has done, okay? So God's intention from the very beginning of creation was to have a man that looked like him, that was his image after his likeness, or that was like him. Amen? And that person or persons would then have dominion over his creation. They would be in charge. They would be the king of this world. Right? Well, Adam blew that. And now Satan, the scripture says, is king of the world. King of this world. Little key. God, it says. Little G. God of this world. Right? We were supposed to be the God of this world. That's what Jesus brought us back to. 
we've been redeemed to the position that Adam and Eve were before they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Adam and Eve were not perfect. They were innocent. Yes. Because there wasn't any law. Right. Right? Right. They were like a, a baby. They do bad stuff, but they're innocent because they don't know it's bad. They don't know what's good. They don't know what's bad. That's what we call the age of accountability and all these things. We were redeemed not back to being, you know, angelic. We were redeemed back to innocence. Yes. Where there should be no more knowledge of sin. Exactly. But what we do in church is remind you every yes. service of how sinful you are. Yeah. How can you ever have no sin consciousness right. if all you're ever hearing about is sin? See, this is a chat. This is where renewing of the mind comes. You've got to get to a place where you don't think about sin. Right. Where sin isn't always on your mind. Was that a sin? Was that a sin? Oh, I'm thinking this. I shouldn't. Um, ooh, wow. No, you just don't worry about it. It's all good between me and God. And then you won't obsess with it. Sure. You know, as Paul said, look, I, I didn't know anything. I never was bothered with uh, covet covetousness until I seen it yeah. in the Word of God. And then I became covetous of everything. I wanted everything I didn't have. I wanted everybody else's stuff. Yeah. But I didn't ever think about it until I saw that it was illegal. Yeah. Right? It's like, keep off the grass. Yeah. Put a sign up, and I guarantee you, you'll have a trail through that yeah. place in no time. <laughs> Wet paint. People are walking around with painted butts because they just can't help themselves. Right? right? They just got to, if it's no, you got to do it, you know? Yeah. That's human nature. That's the fallen nature. I want what I don't have, even if it's the worst thing in the world for me. That's the truth. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Okay, Romans 8, 19 through 21. See, we're supposed to be in charge of this earth. This, this earth, plants, animals, everything is supposed to be submitted to us. We're supposed to be dominating this. We try it with, by gardening. Amen. By having pets, livestock, the pets bite you, they run off, they bite the neighbor, amen, or you got weeds in the garden and you, no, the faster you pull them out, the faster they grow back. We try to because it's, it's in our nature to want to be dominant, mm -hmm. but when we do dominate, then we become idiots yeah. and we become brutal and vicious and everything. Instead of using the authority we have, we try to use fear and power so on and so forth. I told you about my dog, didn't I, last week? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He was charged with chasing a man on a bicycle. And I said, that's a lie. My dog doesn't even have a bicycle. <laughs> it was so good I had to repeat it. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Praise the Lord. So the groaning, amen, and the, the travailing is because not only are we going to be set free, amen, from bondage and corruption, but the creation itself, amen, it's going to be set free into this glorious liberty of the children of God. See, the hope of creation, whether you realize it or not, is that there will be a people that are just like God. Because yes. the only way it's ever yes. going to be like it's supposed to be. That's it. That it knows. Yes. Weeds aren't supposed to be. Fleas, ticks. Yeah. Come on, mosquitoes. They don't belong here. No. No. Praise the Lord. That's right. But they are here. And just like we're moaning and groaning about them, the whole creation is operating Inside, it's groaning. It's thinking, it, this isn't supposed to be this way, you know. Amen. And they understand. Somehow, there's got to be a people that will be like God for this, this, this thing to change. Praise God. All right. Acts 3, 19 through 21. 3. Acts 3, 19 through 21. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. He shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the time of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world, since the world began. 
So to repent means to change your mind. Right? That's the literal translation. Where, like he says, renew your mind. So you can change your You can't change your mind unless you have some other information to put in there with the stuff that you already got. So that's what he's talking about here. Repent. Change your mind. Get a better way of looking at this and understanding this, okay? Change your mind or renew your mind. And so this, this scripture, if, if, if you were to read it, it's got more than one meaning. But the one thing is sure. With every repentance, with every renewing of the mind, we manifest Jesus instead of ourselves. Amen. He sends forth Jesus with every renewing of our mind. Every time we repent, every time we think the way we're supposed to think, there is a revealing or there is a, a sending forth of Christ, of the Spirit of God. Amen. He sends forth Jesus. He's telling us. See, the heavens, the spirit realm retains him. The heavens hold him back until the times of restitution. Every time we change, every time we think differently, every time we respond differently because of the way that we're thinking, the heavens have, the heavens that have been retaining him no longer hold him back. He's revealed. Does that make sense to you? That's why the emphasis is on the renewing of the mind. The only way Jesus gets revealed, the only way he is, he's retained, as long as I'm Nathan, yeah. Yeah. no Jesus. Right. Just Nathan. Right. Amen? It's only when I renew my mind to who I really am in Christ right. that Jesus gets exactly. released, that he gets exactly. sent forth. See, that's, the, that's the, what seemingly is, you know, uh, schizophrenia in Christianity is just simply a, a lack of renewing the mind or renewing our mind to religious traditions and man's gospel into, instead of the one of Jesus Christ. So we see little manifestation. Every time we change our mind, every time we repent, there's an appearing. There's a manifestation of the Lord in us. There's a revealing of Christ in me. The hope of glory. Amen? So the question to us then becomes, are we going to change how we operate so that we can reign with God? I'm not talking about being perfect and without failures and without shortcomings. I'm talking about the way we think, yes. about getting our minds renewed. And then we're going, are we going to change our thoughts, which will then change our words, which will also change our actions so that we can identify with God? Because you're never going to say anything that you haven't thought first. Everybody say, oh, I just slipped out. No, I didn't. Right. <laughs> you just let it out. Right. It's what you were thinking or you wouldn't have said it. Right. Amen. And whatever we do, we have to think. Even reflexes have to yeah. be coming from some place. And it comes from here. Yeah. So we only do what we think. Well, if I'm thinking wrong, I'm going to be doing wrong. Yeah. Right? So we've got to get our minds renewed. Right. Praise the Lord. So that we can identify with God. All right. Genesis 32. 22 through 26. Genesis 32, verses 22 through 26. You know, it'd be nice to just do this in 30 minutes, but I have to tell you the truth. You got to hear that. We have to hear this over and over and over in every possible way we can with as much scripture as possible yes. to convince this and this yeah. of what this already knows. Yes. Amen. Because this already agrees with the Spirit. Yes. It'll, it'll bear witness. You can, you can feel the witness even if you don't get it all intellectually. If you haven't yeah. unraveled it all, you still know there's something more than this. There's something more than just what's going on. Amen. So he rose up that night and took his two wives and his two women servants and his eleven sons and passed over the four Jabbok. And he took them and he sent them over the brook and sent them over that he sent over that he had or sent over his stuff. And Jacob was left alone and there he wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh and the hollow of Jacob's thigh. Now when the angel, when the angelic being saw that he wasn't winning the battle, he just touched the hollow of his thigh and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go, the angel speaking, let me go for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go unless except thou bless me. Right. Amen. So this, is, this man named Jacob is running away from his brother. Well, he's, he's on his way to the place, but he's trying to avoid his brother. 
And his brother's name is Esau. And the reason for that is Esau is going to kill him because Jacob had stolen Esau's birthright. Now, Jacob's name means uh, manipulator or deceiver. Supplanter, he has another word. There's just all d different ones, but they all have similar meanings. Amen? And so this is, this is Jacob. And the reason for that is that Jacob had manipulated and deceived his brother. His brother was not very spiritual in the sense of he didn't care much about the birthright. He just, you know, didn't care much about it. But he believed it to be his, and so Jacob took it. So this is Jacob talking to the angel of the Lord that God had sent this angel to cause Jacob to rise up to his true identity. Now, God had told Jacob's mother that the elder would serve the younger, even though the elder was supposed to be the inheritor and the, uh, the, the inheritor of the birthright, which was Esau, because he was a few seconds or minutes or whatever it was earlier. They were twins. But God told his mother, the younger one, Jacob, is going to be ruling over the elder, even though legally that wasn't the way it was supposed to be. Spiritually, that was the way it was going to be. Amen? So God sends this angel, and the reason for the angel is not to wrestle all night with Jacob, but to get Jacob to understand who he really is. That he isn't just this deceiver. This was part of God's plan. He might have went about it in the wrong way. He might not have used the best spiritual ways of handling it, but he was still the guy that God said that he was yes. in his mother's womb, right? Yes. Before he was born. And so this is also a metaphor for God's grace and God's supernatural assistance. Right? Yeah. He just graced this to Jacob. Amen. And then gives him supernatural assistance, assistance to make it come to pass. All right. Look at Genesis 32 now, 27 and 28. Keep this in mind, in, in the context of what we're talking about here this morning. And he said unto him, what's your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, the angel did, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel for as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and has prevailed. This goes all the way back to the garden, but it also deals with us today. So God changes Jacob's name to Israel. Yeah. Now, the end of the word Israel is El, which is God. Mm -hmm. Amen? Which means God. So Jacob began reigning with God as soon as he was identified with his true identity. Yeah. When he understood who he really was, who God declared him to be, not Esau, not mom and dad, not the neighborhood, but who God said. Yes. Okay? All right. Now let's go to Romans chapter 5 and verse 17. Yes. Now God says, I'm his son. Amen? Yep. He said he gave me a new name. Yes. yes. Praise the Lord. Yep. If I focus on this... I'll never get that. You can wrestle with it all you want to. You can fight with it night in and night out, day in and day out with the flesh. But the only way it's coming is by you listening to what God is saying rather than what you're saying. So for, by if, for if by one man's offense death reign by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. So Jacob wrestled for a revelation of who he really was. And that was a man who was made to reign with God. Yes, yes. Just as Adam was originally made to reign as the image or the manifestation of God in the earth. This is what God has given us. Yes. It's just the extension of his initial plan. Nothing's changed. God never, he never came to make us better people. I mean, that should be an extension of what happens, but He didn't come to make us better people. He came to make us His children. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. Ephesians 1, verses 18 through 20. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of His calling and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. What's, what's His calling? What's, what's His desire for you? That you be perfect? No. He, he wants you to get a revelation of the riches of the glory of our inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of His power to us who believe according to the working of His, His mighty power. Which He wrought in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and set Him at His own right hand in the heavenly places. This is Christ in you, the hope of glory he's talking about. But look at Ephesians 2 and 6.
and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, in the same position, in the same place, in the same authority. That's what the right hand means. It's power. It's authority of God. Yes. We are to rule and reign. Yes. See, you know, there, there are people that would say, you're blaspheming. How can you say that? You're making yourself God. I'm not doing anything of the kind. I'm telling you what the Bible says. We are the God now of this world. Little G. He's still God Almighty and nobody's taken His place. Right. But it was He that said, you will reign with me. Yes. 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 Amen. I'm just saying what He said and that's what a good son would do. Yes. I'm not calling my dad a liar. No. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. So, we are the righteousness of God in Christ. Righteousness is a, it's a definition of God, just like God is love. God is righteous. He is the righteous one. He declares us, not, it's not my righteousness, it's His righteousness. No weapon formed against you will prosper, but every tongue that rises in judgment against you, you can condemn it because your righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Isaiah 54. I mean, this isn't, I'm not saying, I'm not doing this stuff by trying to pull some weird scripture out of context and then try to shove it down your throat like it's a doctrine or we're going to begin a new denomination here. I'm not interested in any of that. I'm going through all of the Bible so that you can see that it's by out of the mouth of two or three witnesses yes. a matter is established. It's, yes. it's established by the word of God, not my interpretation or not my, my uh, particular bent on this. Amen. In the Old Testament, the descendants of Abraham were called the children of Israel. Remember, if you read anything back there, you know, he's, Abraham's offspring and his grandchildren and so on and so forth, the 12 tribes, they all come out of Abraham. Amen. Jacob being the grandson. They were all called the children of Israel. Now, remember, Jacob was Abraham's grandson. Amen. And was renamed Israel. He was renamed Israel by God. And what happened? He received a revelation of who he was. Yes. Amen. All right. The church in the New Testament is spiritual Israel. Yes. Jesus. You are the church. Yes. We are collectively, but you are individually. If there wasn't anybody else, you'd be the church. Yes. So you are the church. You are the body of Christ. Collectively, we are as well. But individually, that's what we are. Yes. We are the temple of God. Yes. All right. So... The church in the New Testament is spiritual Israel. And the children of Abraham. Yes. Uh -huh. Right? So now the children of Abraham doesn't, doesn't mean the natural descendants, but his spiritual descendants. Uh -huh. That's what the scripture teaches. Amen. Those who are of the same faith as Abraham. Yes. Amen. Galatians 3, verses 6 and 7. What did, what did Abraham do? He didn't do anything except he believed what God said. Abraham believed God and God called that righteous. And you read the story of Abraham. He wasn't in the natural righteous. He, he pimped out his wife. Yeah. He did all kinds of stupid stuff. Yeah. He didn't obey God. God told him to go here. He didn't go there. He went to, to Egypt. He sold his wife basically to a Pharaoh because he was afraid they'd kill him if they knew she was his wife. Uh -huh. Amen. And when God came to the Pharaoh for taking his wife, put her in his harem, pre preparing her for himself, he said, you're going to die tonight. Yeah. And, the, and the Pharaoh said, hey, I didn't touch her. I don't, I, I, the man told me it was his sister. Yeah. And God said, that was my prophet, and you better have him pray for you, or you've had your last child in this nation. Yes. Uh -huh. God called the liar and the deceiver his righteous prophet and the guy who didn't look like he had done anything God says you're, you're as good as dead because one was in God had a relationship with God and the other didn't it's the only difference it's a, par it's a picture of us today we didn't do anything for this Abraham didn't do anything except he believed God and he still was a screw up in a lot of ways Took him years and years before he really got to the place where he'd actually willing to sacrifice his own son. Yeah. I mean, he didn't even believe that he was going to have a son, which is why he jumped his maid, his wife's maid, yeah. to try to make something happen naturally that God said was going to be a miracle. Yeah. 
This is what religion does. Yeah. Tries to create new creatures in Christ without a, a real faith and grace experience. Right. Even as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham. That's us. Praise the Lord. Abraham believed God. He didn't believe religious tradition because there really wasn't any. All he had was a pagan religion. There wasn't any law, so it couldn't have been anything to do with the law. The law wouldn't come for another thousand years or more. So Romans chapter 9, verses 6 through 8. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Isaac was the promised child. So everybody that come out of Abraham was not the seed of Abraham in God's eyes. You see what I'm saying? Galatians 3 verse 29. If you be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Praise the Lord. So since the outpouring of the Spirit in Acts chapter 2, Peter said to the, he, this is what he said to the, 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 the Jews that were there that day. He said, these guys are all drunk. You know, you must be high on something because it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. And the Holy Spirit had just been poured out. But Peter said to them that they had crucified the Savior that God had sent to save them. And from that point on, when the Bible speaks of the Old Covenant Israel, it calls them Israel after the flesh. In other words, they weren't spiritual because they never had the Spirit. They were living by rules. They were living by the law. Amen? So, uh, those who rejected Christ were referred to by Paul as his kinsmen according to the flesh. Bloodlines, he was connected. Spiritually, there was no connection. Because they have to be born again. Uh -huh. Now there will be a remnant. I'm not, I'm not denying what God has said. I'm just saying that was the issue. That was the, where it was at. And this is all bled over into the, into the Christian church, into Christianity. Same kind of mixture and confusion and mm -hmm. all the rest of it. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. It's a simplicity of the gospel. Yeah. That's what it is. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Now, I didn't read all of it because if I did, you'd accuse me of, uh, you know, trying to manipulate women or control. <laughs> I don't believe that, and I don't believe God did. We had some uh, gentlemen here that preached that every time he got an opportunity because he couldn't make his wife do what he wanted her to do. I call that marriage. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, but he was just intent on getting women to feel like they were subservient somehow. And yeah. I mean, Jesus was, this is, there is no Jew, there's no Gentile, there's no Greek, there's no bond, there's no white, there's no black, there's no male, there's no female. This is just the way it is. In Christ, we are all the same. Praise the Lord. So, but that, that scripture, and that's the point of this scripture is, uh, look at, just, I'll, I'll just show you. Just drop down to verse 32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. He's not even really talking about our marital relationships. He's just using that as a metaphor to show us how we are to interact with Christ, how we are to understand Jesus. Amen. So the church is spiritual Israel, right? The covenant relationship is the result that comes from changing your name. Right? I mean, even, even if women choose to keep their maiden name, you know, hyphenated or however, they still have a change of name. That's the, that's the thing he's talking about here. He said this is like a covenant. And you get a name change. He's the husband. We are the bride of Christ. Right? So he's trying to make that 
example that this is what we're talking about here. We're not talking about husbands and wives and so on and so forth. He's talking about him. He has made us acceptable, spotless, without blemish, perfect. Amen. You know, the, yes. the bride on her wedding day in the white gown, pristine, pure, all that goes with that. Yeah. You know, the symbolism there. All right, John 15, 16. And we're getting there. We're almost done, so I won't be real long. Ye have not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, it, it, he may give it you. And you can see the, the metaphors going on in there, bringing forth fruit, it's childbearing, and so on and so forth. That's the, you know, the symbolism. He's talking about bringing forth fruit of God or bringing forth manifestations of God. Bringing forth a revealing of Christ. And it comes through this covenant relationship of us becoming little God. Yes. All right? We didn't earn this. He said, I chose you. You didn't choose me. The Holy Spirit, nobody comes to God unless the Holy Spirit draws them. Exactly. We don't get credit even for that. Right. Amen? So it was given to us by God. Jesus earned it for us. Yes. We have to see ourselves the way God sees us. Yes. Crowned, he says, with glory and honor. Praise the Lord. I mean, you got to do a lot of renewing yeah. of the mind yeah. mm -hmm. to see yourself that way. Right. It's an ongoing thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. The blessings that were Abraham's by faith belong to us the same way. Right. Exactly the same. Right. It's part of our inheritance. Romans 4.16 You have not chosen me, I've chosen you. Romans 4.16 Therefore, it is a faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. The just shall live by faith. Praise the Lord. Hebrews 10, 37 through 39. I know we're right at the point where... The mind can receive no more than the seed can endure. So just hang in there. Just about out here. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Praise the Lord. Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. I told you we'd cover every book in the Bible. Somebody name me the ones I haven't spoken from yet. My mind's a blur. <laughs> so he says, I will stand upon my watch, and this is prophetic, okay? So I'll stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say to, unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end, it shall speak and not lie. Look, it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Praise the Lord. So faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You got to hear it. You got to get receive it. Amen. A vision, whatever. Amen. And when we hear the gospel, we hear the finished work of Christ. Uh -huh. In other words, we begin to live out of what we believe to be true. Yes. Praise the Lord. John 8, 31. Look, I'm not going to read. Let's skip this. I, I, we won't go there because it's just too long. It would be good, but I'm not going to take the time. If I believe that I am the righteousness of God, yep. a manifestation of God in the new creature, amen, the new creation, uh -huh. In Christ, then I'm going to live that way. Yes. I'm going to believe when I lay hands on the sick, they'll recover. I'm going to believe I can cast out demons. I'm going to believe that whatever I set my hand to will prosper. I'll believe I'm blessed in the city, blessed yes. in the field. I'm blessed going in, blessed coming out. Amen. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to believe that's my identity. That's my reality. Amen? See, the law is not a faith. In fact, Paul said it shuts up faith. It stops faith from operating. Amen? It keeps us blind 
to the revelation of who we are in Christ. It keeps us focused on our sin instead of on our righteousness. The sin is the finished work. Jesus already finished that and declared us to be the righteousness of God in Him. Alright? Hebrews 9, verse 26 through 28. Hebrews 9, 26 through 28. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. It's not something he's going to do. It's something he already did. Yeah. Amen. We... We don't walk by an it. Remember Habakkuk? Right. We walk by a he. Yes. We walk by faith. Yes. Amen? Look at Habakkuk 2 again, verses 3 and 4. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not right in him, but the just shall live by his faith. <laughs> Amen? We don't live by an it. We don't live by a, a rule or something coming. We live by the finished work. We live by faith. Yes. He has come. Yes. Right? Now, I understand the pro prophecies of a, a, a second coming of the Lord, but that's not what Habakkuk's talking about. He's talking about the first time he comes because yes. he hadn't come yet. Right. right. Amen? I'm not saying there won't be a second coming of the Lord. I'm saying that is not the issue here. He's talking about it will speak. It will come. It will do what it's supposed to do. Well, we're, not, we're not following in it anymore. They were because they didn't know what it was. But we know and now we do what he said. Because if we understand that our soul which is lifted up is not upright in him. But the just shall live by faith. There they, they could not live by faith because they had, they had no spirit. They had rules. That's what they lived by. Praise the Lord. Romans 1.17 The just shall live by faith. Yeah. When we read, when we hear, when we understand the Word of God, we understand that it's all about revealing Christ. It's all about a manifestation of God yeah. in a human being. That's it. That's it. I'll close with this. Romans 12.2 if you'll go back there. We'll wrap this up. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you can prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Change your mind so that you can be a revelation of what God really is wanting to do. Yep. Here's my translation on the worst translation. Stop assuming an outward expression that doesn't come from within you and doesn't represent who and what you are really. Who you are in the inner being but it's patterned after natural thinking about religious thinking. Instead, change your outward expression to one that comes from your inner being, the new creation, by renewing your mind to who God says you are, and that will result in you putting God's will to work and finding that it meets all the specifications, yes. all the requirements, mm -hmm. and then say amen to it. Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. Because all of his promises to us are yea, and in him, amen. amen. Quit looking at yourself externally. Start seeing yourself as God sees you. And then put that to work in your life. Yes. And as you see it begin to unfold, say amen to it. Yeah. Say, yeah, I agree with this. This is right. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you so much for your patience. I know this was a long one, but man, let's apply this. I've had enough religion in my life. I want Jesus. I mean, I want to see a manifestation of God. And I'm not talking about being some quirky, weirdo, uh, religious jerk. I'm talking about just being me and letting God operate in that reality. He knew me before the foundation of the world. He decided, I'd like to try that out. Praise the Lord. And he said the same thing about you. So let's let him.
Let him praise God. God bless all of you. Have a great rest of the day. Hope we'll see you back here next Sunday. God bless you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.